Perhaps the most important thing to consider when planning comprehension activities for kindergarten and second graders is that these children are worlds apart developmentally. Kindergartners and second graders are on either side of the five to seven shift, a period of dramatic cognitive development during the early elementary school years. In classic Piagetian terms, five-year-old kindergartners are in the pre-operational stage. These children are learning more about words in their world every day and have a developing sense of how to use books. Though these children are somewhat skilled at mental imagery and have cultivated a large and growing vocabulary, they have not yet developed multidimensional reasoning skills. Children in this developmental stage tend to be able to focus on one dimension or aspect of a task at a time. Primary tasks such as learning the names of the letters of the alphabet or remembering a series of events in a story can tax a young memory and maintaining attention over time can be difficult too. These children will rapidly gather personal experience with which to link new information over the course of the next two short years. Second graders are in the concrete operational stage of development and are capable of metacognition. They have more practice memories and attention spans and use them to activate prior knowledge, ask and answer deeper questions, and summarize what they have learned. These children have greater experiences with books and can read them independently without the heavy cognitive burden of constant decoding. As a teacher at this school, I would tailor my instructional approaches to comprehension to fit the unique cognitive needs of both age groups. For kindergartners, the foundation of my instruction would be the read aloud. Research indicates that the single most important activity to predict independent reading success is reading aloud to children. The net gains are greatest when the child actively participates in the discussion of the plot, the characters, and the meaning of new words they hear. As a kindergarten educator, I would be sure to designate ample time for reading aloud during the school day. Books selected for read alouds would extend far beyond the standard storybook and would include engaging texts of all genres such as lists, recipes, informational books, historical accounts, and songs to expand children's background knowledge. Key vocabulary and important concepts in these texts would be identified in a pre-reading book walk. Children would benefit both from the subject matter of the read aloud and from the reading itself as they hear new vocabulary words, fluent and expressive reading, and learn modeled comprehension strategies such as summarizing and predicting. Students can practice this new knowledge themselves as they ask and respond to questions about what they have heard. Other methods of assessing kindergarten comprehension include sequencing pictures, retelling plots, and reenacting stories. Practicing such skills will help students learn new vocabulary and use it in everyday life link text to themselves, and draw inferences in what they read and hear. Such skills are important both in terms of satisfying state standards and as a segue into more advanced shared, interactive, and guided reading comprehension tasks in later grades. Second graders are capable of metacognition, that is, thinking about their thinking. Teaching in a way so as to capitalize on this new skill is critical in second grade. As a second grade teacher, I would make literature discussion the focus of comprehension-based instruction. Children in second grade can not only comment on what they've read or heard, they can clarify, revise, augment, and summarize their own and others' contributions. Children in second grade are able to read or be read a text and readily make predictions, draw upon previous knowledge, make connections to themselves or other characters, and recall important information about the text, such as the setting or the main characters. While oral language would still be valuable, these children should also have the opportunity to keep a written log of their own responses to text read individually or as a group. Both group and individual reading should be stressed at this grade level, as these reading environments will allow for the practice of metacognitive strategies. Sharing individual reading with the class fosters oral language proficiency, as well as comprehension skills such as summarizing and clarifying personal ideas. For group reading, differentiated guided reading groups give the teacher an opportunity to work directly with students at all reading levels and pose comprehension questions specific to the level of each group. Children can use guided reading time as a chance to practice their own comprehension skills, such as predicting and questioning, as well as see them modeled by their peers and the teacher. Children at this age are also more capable of group interactions and problem solving than they were when they were younger. I would make the most of these abilities and assign reciprocal teaching roles in group work. Personifying strategies, such as answering questions as a group, will help children internalize these skills in their independent reading. Oral language is the first area of English developed by English language learners. It is important to remember that there may appear to be discrepancies between these children's speaking abilities and their reading or writing skills. This is because BICS, Basic Interpersonal Conversational Skills, or Playground Language, emerge within the first two years of exposure to a language, while True Fluency, Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency, or CALP, takes seven to ten years to develop. Instruction must always be scaffolded for the ELL with these facts in mind. One of the best things an educator can do for an English language learner is to foster the child's confidence. I would do this by incorporating icons all around my classroom. Using a pocket chart with pictures dictating the day's schedule can establish confidence-boosting knowledge of routine. I would also have icons and printed words labeling objects in my classroom to maximize learning through exposure to environmental print. The simple use of gestures and facial expressions when teaching can help students understand your message before they are ready to understand your words. 
I would be clear and concise with my wording while providing many body language cues to my students. My communication with ELL students would extend in the other direction as well. Instead of correcting a child's words, I would respond to his meaning and elaborate on it. This would not only show the child that his attempts at communication were successful, but also that I value and accept what he has to say. I would also be sure to extend communication to the parents of the English language learners in my classroom. They are a great resource for me in terms of getting to better know this child and his needs. After all, parents are our students' first teachers. I would take every opportunity to encourage parents to come into my classroom as they were able, but would understand that family or career conflicts might preclude such visits. To keep the lines of communication open, I would send regular letters home and make myself available after hours to get to know the families in my class. I would invite the parents to come and see the classroom, take a school tour, or tell stories to the class in their native language to foster a sense of multicultural openness and inclusion rather than merely tolerance. In terms of instruction, thematic planning, which involves the integration of many subjects into literacy instruction, such as life sciences or social studies, would spark students' interest in reading and writing activities, encourage the development of academic language, and offer opportunities to practice using content-specific vocabulary and language structures. I would pay special attention to the grouping needs of my students. English language learners are at all different levels and deserve to be grouped differentially, just like their native English-speaking peers. The grouping process is quite difficult as oral language, reading, and writing abilities can vary significantly within and between children in the same class. I would make sure to group children based on what they know and keep these groupings flexible like any other differentiated group. I would incorporate rich and inviting texts into my classroom both for whole class activities and small group work. These texts would include all genres of writing as well as books that would be culturally relevant to my class. Not only will these books help provide ELLs with exposure to oral language and English texts that they might not receive elsewhere, they will help my class develop the confidence and sense of belonging that all children deserve to experience at school. Word study is essential to literacy, for learning to read involves understanding that printed letters and words represent individual sounds and speech, also known as phonemic awareness. This is the hardest part of developing phonological awareness, and if it is not explicitly taught, roughly 20% of all children will develop reading difficulties. There are four key aspects to phonemic awareness, word awareness, rhyme, syllabication, and attending to individual phonemes. The most important tasks for word work at the preschool level are letter and word awareness, rhyme awareness, and the beginnings of attention to syllables. By the end of preschool, children should be able to identify and generate rhymes, detect beginning sounds and words, name 10 to 18 letters, and attend to multisyllabic words. In order to bolster rhyme and word awareness skills, I would provide these emergent readers and spellers many opportunities to interact with all kinds of text and environmental print, such as nursery rhymes, poems, songs, word walls, and signs. Because children cannot yet fully read, picture word sorts, memorize songs, and explicit instruction to listen for a target sound tend to work well to encourage attention to rhyme. Words Their Way provides a comprehensive set of teacher directions, student assessments, and reproducible picture sorts to encourage these skills. First graders should be able to accurately decode one-syllable words, count blend and segment syllables, and spell words containing short vowels. They are beginner readers and letter name spellers with a rudimentary to full concept of word. These children should be grouped differentially and engage in sorts from a systematic phonics instruction like Words Their Way to build sight words and ease the cognitive burden of decoding. Research suggests that low ability first graders may also benefit from individual phoneme instruction in addition to the systematic whole word approach. Some children may work better when they can analyze individual phonemes before translating these patterns into rhymes and words. It is important to remember that regardless of age or ability level, children will learn these skills at their own pace. The best bet for building phonemic awareness is tying new information into a child's existing knowledge and strengths. If you make reading self relevant, reading will be fun. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you have a great winter break.